Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning, Barbara. <laughs> thank you, Gary. <laughs> Uh, a joy to be here this morning and to meet with God's people, to worship him, hear from his word, and just spend time together. And we welcome those who are following on the internet, and uh, it, we're very happy that you're part of that. So we're going to start off by s singing two songs, first of all, uh, at the start of our service. So here's the first one, Song of Moses. Would you like to stand? <laughs> Shines the sun. What 
again to our service some people who've just arrived and uh, as you can see we've got a big day today we're going to have we're going to share together in communion and then of course we have our AGM after the service and I'm sure Steve will talk about that later on in the news section but today we're continuing our series sermon series with a topic a fair question and the question today is is he the Christ a very simple question, yet one that has eternal significance. In Jesus' time, we saw that some people believed he was the Christ, some people didn't believe and opposed him, and others had questions. And so it is today, really, exactly the same. Some of us believe that Jesus is the Christ and our Saviour. Others don't believe that. And indeed, there's a growing opposition to Christianity in the community in general. And so there might be some people here today who have some questions. They're not sure, really sure that Jesus is their Christ. And if, if that's so, there'll be an opportunity later on um, after the service if you wanted to ask some questions. So we're going now into our uh, communion uh, service. So we're going to start by affirming what we do believe in saying the creed, in the creed. So I think we might stand again and say this creed. With all Christians everywhere, we believe in one God. We believe in God the Father, maker of all things. We believe in his Son, Jesus Christ, Lord and Saviour of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, giver of life and light. Father sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus rose again as Lord of all, and we might live forever with him. God sent his Holy Spirit to live in us so we may grow more like Jesus. We belong to the church, God's family everywhere. Amen. In that, uh, in that creed, we, we talked about the fact that we believe that God sent his son to rescue us. Uh, and it's always good to, to share and to tell each other that, to remind each other of those things. Um, but one of the ways we remind each other is by sharing the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that now. And so we're going to do this as a church family. Uh, and so when it comes to that, I don't know if the kids would like to sit with mum and dad just as, so you can kind of share it as a family, because that would be lovely. At the moment, stay where you are, that's fine. Uh, but we may maybe move back when it gets to that. We'll, we'll share as a family. That would be really great. Um, so if we click on to the next one. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to, uh, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we're just going to remember what it's all about and re remember, I guess, when Jesus actually started, uh, gave it to us for us to share and remember. 
And so I'm going to say the words that are in the kind of lighter font. Uh, and if you could respond with the ones that are kind of italicised and a little bit bigger. Does that make sense? It's also indented a bit, so that makes it easier. Okay. So, lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yes, he is worthy of all praise. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Therefore we lift our voices in praise to you, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We praise you especially for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross offered once and for all time the one true sacrifice for sin, reconciling us to you and satisfying your just demands. By rising to new life, Jesus has secured eternal deliverance for his people. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever indeed. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread, like the ones we had at the front, and when he gave it, he broke it and gave it to his, when he gave him thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord to proclaim our fellowship in his death. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus. So I want to invite you to uh, remain in our seats and Gary and I will bring the bread and the, uh, the, the juice around. Right, thank you for your patience. Uh, please take and eat this in remembrance that Christ's body was broken, that your sins can be forgiven, and be thankful. Take and eat this, and by faith we feed on the blood of Christ that was shed for each one of us so that our sins can be forgiven. So let's drink together. Let me pray. Father, thank you for feeding us who have received these, your gifts of bread and wine, with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are members of his body. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What a great celebration and reminder of what Christ has done for so us. And now we come to the central part of our service where we read from God's word and Steve will speak to us. So Mark and Graham are going to come up and do the Bible readings for us. Thank you. First reading is from John <coughs> chapter 7, beginning at verse 14. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own, it comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honour for himself. But he who works for the honour of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon possessed, the crowd answered, who is trying to kill you. Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs. You circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing, a whole <coughs> sorry, for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Take you reading in John 7 verse 25. 
some people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it be that this, the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from and when the Christ appears no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me and you know where I come from? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that he we may not find him. Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome everyone. Nice to, nice to see you all. Uh, if you're a visitor here, it's great to see some visitors here this morning. And uh, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of a series looking at the Gospel of John, looking at the person of Jesus, uh, and we're, particularly we're thinking about some of the questions that people ask about him. I don't know if you have any questions about Jesus, uh, but if you do, um, I hope that today will be helpful. How about I pray, and uh, then we'll get into the Bible together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you've given us your word, uh, that you've revealed yourself, through us, uh, yourself to us through your Son, who we see in the Scriptures. Lord, as we look at um, John chapter 7 today, help us to understand a little bit better who he is uh, and at least how we can find out more about him. And so, Father, we ask that you would uh, guide us and uh, teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many of you will know this already, um, but I think for those of you who don't know it, uh, it's really important that you do. Um, you, you need to know that I am the greatest person who has ever lived. Um, the world has been waiting for a very... I'm not sure why you're laughing. Uh, the, the world has been waiting for a very long time for someone like me. Um, I don't know if you realise, but I was destined to be the king of the world. Um, anything you could possibly want, anything you possibly need, I can give it to you. Um, if you want physical things, I can make it so that you are completely satisfied. You want relationships? Well, now that you know me, you won't need anyone else. Um, and if you want great experiences, well, life with me is just going to be one blast after another. It's going to be fantastic. So it's a privilege, actually, for you to have me here. So thank you. I hope... I'm not sure why you guys are laughing. Who, uh, who believes me when I say that I'm the greatest, most important person that's ever lived? <laughs> just Graham Peck. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> fantastic. I, Graham knows me well. Um, I guess you could say that those kind of claims I made about myself are, are a little bit arrogant. 
do you think? Just a touch, just a tad different, uh, arrogant, yeah. Um, they're quite outrageous claims, and particularly, my guess is, that, well, you probably, it's probably right for you to feel that way, to feel a bit kind of, Steve, what are you talking about? Um, look, we know you, and you are not the greatest person, let me tell you, um, that has ever lived. Um, it's fair enough for you to have questions about me. Um, I mean, if you're going to make those kind of claims, I should be able to back it up, shouldn't I? And you'd never see me do all those kinds of things, and so why would you believe it? Well, I have to say, um, although, yeah, maybe I was making, going, stretching things just a, a tad, um, I'm not the first person to make outrageous claims like that. Um, there was another guy who'd said similar things. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. His name's Jesus. Um, I want you to come back with me some 2,000 years to the Feast of Tabernacles. We're in Jerusalem, and in the, in the Jewish calendar, there are a number of um, particular feasts that people would need to come to Jerusalem, and the Feast of Tabernacles was one of them. It's a very dramatic ceremony where people would come from all over the country and they would come into Jerusalem. You can imagine what it would be like. It's kind of like a mixture of the Easter show and New Year's Eve and you know, market day and the holidays, like all, all mixed into one. Everybody is there, um, and so much so that there's not enough accommodation. So they actually build uh, little temporary dwellings, which are called booths. In fact, sometimes this is called the Feast of Booths. Um, basically, these people would come and they'd live on people's roofs or, or just in the middle of uh, out, out the street, that kind of thing, just under temporary shelters. Because the, uh, the aim of this celebration was to remember that they'd been in the wilderness and that God had provided for them in the wilderness. Um, and even when they came into the Easter show, it, not to Easter show, I just read Easter show. <laughs> even when they, Freud didn't slip there. Even when they came to the promised land, which is not the Easter show, even when they came to the promised land, it's going to be a long day, I can tell that. Um, <laughs> When they came into the promised land, God continued to provide for them. And so this celebration was meant to be a time where they remembered God's provision. And so it's an exciting time. Like People are from all over the country. And they're catching up with distant relatives and those kinds of things. They're seeing people they see every year when they get together. They, they, they see them again. Oh, it's nice to see you again. Um, it's a bit of a buzz. But this year there's more of a buzz because somebody has caught, been causing a stir. It's Jesus. Now, interestingly, he's actually not there. Back in uh, chapter 7, verse 3 and 4, Jesus' brothers say to him, Jesus, you really need to go to, the, to this festival because you've been doing these amazing things, feeding 5,000 people, walking on the water, healing people from a distance. You know, he's been doing lots of amazing things, but Jesus, you're doing it up here in the north in Galilee. Really, you need to go where the action is. You need to take your miracles to where the crowds are and then you'll start to get a great big following. And so that's what his brothers say to him. But Jesus says, no, 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 that's not what I'm about. Um, you go. Uh, I'm not going at the moment. And so his brothers go off. Um, and so at, initially Jesus is not at the festival. But it doesn't mean that people aren't talking about him. And you can kind of imagine what people are talking about. Um, there's some of them who are going, oh, I was at this wedding and I saw Jesus turn water into wine. It was incredible. Other people are going, yeah, but I was at the temple when he turned over all the, all the tables and stuff and he caused a great mess. Yeah, but, but I saw him heal a guy's son from 50 kilometres away. Oh, yeah, but I heard that he was, he, somebody found him talking to a Samaritan woman. Goodness. Yeah, but, but I, I heard that he fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. Maybe even water, walked on the water. Yeah, but you should have been here last time he was here. Last time he was here, he healed somebody on the Sabbath and so that the authorities are now out to get him. It's been John 7 verse 11, people are asking, where is he? He's been doing all these amazing things. People are, are, are so excited, they're so keen to see him and he's not here. And people have all these different opinions about him. In verse 12, some people say he's a good man. Whereas others say, no, 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 he deceives people. He's a liar. The people are divided because of him. And certainly, whatever, whatever, whatever other people think, it's pretty clear that the Jewish leaders don't like him. Already he's been in the temple overturning the tables, causing trouble. He's been causing arguments with them uh, by healing on the Sabbath. Uh, they're, they're wanting to get rid of him. And it's pretty clear that the, the religious leaders don't like him. Well... Eventually, Jesus does go to the festival, but not with a big pomp and ceremony. 
he just kind of sneaks in the back door and just starts starts teaching people. Um, but when he teaches, he still people still are divided. I like to think that if I if you met Jesus, you'd just be blown away. You ever imagine what it's like to meet Jesus? It would just be. I just think it would be so incredible to meet this guy who just could just speak right to your very soul. It'd be incredible. However, when people do meet Jesus in the Bible, it's not like that. Some people it's like that. Some people love him, but some people hate him. Some people want to follow him, but others want to arrest him or want to have him killed. In fact, it seems that the religious leaders have made it pretty clear they actually want him wiped out. They want to get rid of Jesus. And it's not just back then, of course, that Jesus has that kind of effect on people. It's, it's the same today, isn't it? Barbara already mentioned at the beginning of the service how Jesus still manages to divide people. You probably know people who think that Jesus is just a joke. That, you know, why would you, why would you follow someone like that? Why would you listen to somebody who was around 2,000 years ago? Why would you bother? Um, whereas there are other people who say, no, I think Jesus is worth following. There are some people who get angry just when you mention his name. How dare you even mention his name? Jesus still divides opinions. So why is that? Why is it that Jesus divides people so much? Well, I think one of the reasons is, well, I have to say, it's kind of Jesus' fault. <laughs> um, Jesus, I think, brings it a little bit on himself by the things that he says. And so I just want to, we're just going to focus on a couple of things. A very long passage today, John chapter 7. We're looking at the whole chapter, really, but... Uh, we're not going to look at every single chapter and every single verse, but we're just going to focus in, zero on a couple of things. And first thing we're going to focus on is one of the, the amazing claims that Jesus makes. You may remember I said that we're at the Feast of Tabernacles. And at that, at that feast, we, we remember that God had provided in the wilderness. And you, what, what, Can anybody remember what are the things that God provided in the wilderness? Can anybody remember any of the things? The manna. Okay, so we've been reminded of the manna. Uh, in the wilderness where we saw Jesus feeding the 5,000. So he provided the manna in the morning and in the evening he provided quail. quail. So every, every day they have manna in the morning, quail in the evening. Um, but when you're walking through the desert, there's something that's really hard to find. Water. water, of course. And so God provided miraculously water for them. Can anybody remember how? Yeah. So Moses whacked a rock with his staff and water came gushing out. Um, God provided for them, even though they thought that they were lost, that they, that they were stuck, but God provided for them. And so to help them remember that, one of the parts of the Feast of Tabernacles was uh, the high priest would walk, would process down from the temple, down to the pool of Siloam with a big jar, uh, gold jar, and he would put it into the water, fill it with water, and then process back up. And all the crowds would be there uh, watching him do this, and he'd walk back up into the temple and it's in, with great ceremony, he would take the water and pour it out next to the altar. A reminder to people of the fact that God had provided, uh, pro provided water in the, in the desert. And so with that graphic reminder in mind, Jesus stands up on the, on the, the most important day, the highlight, the, the climax of, this, of the festival. Uh, and in verse 37... Last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said, yelled in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. In other words, at that very moment, the moment they're remembering God providing water in the wilderness, Jesus is saying, now I will do it. I will provide you this water that won't just last for 40 years in the desert, but will last forever. In fact, it will be like a, a, a well growing up inside you. What I give you will be even better than what God did in the desert. Um, I am the one who will fill your need. It's the same thing he said last, last week, I don't know if you remember, in chapter 6, uh, in verse 35. He says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is saying what I said at the beginning, and you didn't believe, so rudely. Jesus is saying, I am the one who can satisfy you. He's not promising um, kind of like to give them a superpower where they can kind of go, Psh, and water will come out of their hands and, and, and then they can actually drink it. No, he's, he's talking about something spiritual. That that yearning we have, that need that we have for fulfilment and satisfaction and contentment Jesus is saying, I am the one who can give that to you. Come to me and I will give it to you. 
and it will last forever in you. That even though I go away, and they're kind of confused about where he's going. He's talking about his death. He says, even though I go away, you'll still have it because you'll have the Holy Spirit in you. I will give you God's Holy Spirit. Which is pretty impressive, don't you think? It's a pretty big claim. You didn't believe me when I said it. But what about Jesus? When Jesus says, I can satisfy you, I can fulfill you, I can give you that contentment, do you believe it? Well, uh, it's one of those things that the people back then kind of thought, well, who do you think you are? How can you do this? We can't think of really anyone apart from God himself who could do that. Maybe there is one person who could do it. Somebody that God has promised. And so in verse 26, they ask, Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? Is he the Christ? Maybe the Christ can do all these things. Verse 31, When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? Down in verse 41, others said, Yes, he is the Christ. In other words, that big question, Is Jesus the Christ, the one, the king that we've been waiting for, because he's the one that's been promised and he's going to bring all these things. The Old Testament promises talk about the Christ coming and, and, and fulfilling us and giving us eternal life and peace and security. All those things they've been yearning for. And now Jesus is saying he can do it. So can he? Is he the Christ? Well, there's a bit of a problem with that because there's all sorts of ideas about the Christ and where he's from. And, and so as they look back at the Old Testament promises, they're going to go, well, hang on a minute. This doesn't fit. So in verse 27, when that issue of is he really the Christ comes up, people go, no, he can't be. Because we know where this guy come, has come from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. In other words, what they're saying is, look, this guy is just a carpenter's kid. He grew up in Nazareth, in Galilee. And it's not as if he's like suddenly become this great um, political warrior, this great leader. Like he's just grown up, like there are people here who know him. They, they watched, they went to school with him. And they, uh, they, they've spent time with him. When the Messiah comes, he's a big leader, a big, strong, powerful military leader. And when he pe- appears, he's just going to gather people to himself. He's going to show his great power. He's going to be special. But this kid... He's just come from the back of Burke. He's come from nowhere. He's, he's, he's just come from, from the sticks. And apart from anything else, later on they say, when they, when this, again when this question it rises and people say, he is the Christ, again that objection comes up. How can the Christ come, this is in verse 41, how can the Christ, Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family, from Bethlehem, the, day, the, the town where David lived? Yes, there were promises about the Messiah coming, but not from Nazareth, not from Galilee. Like, that's ridiculous. Who comes, who comes from there? It's like saying somebody great's come from Queensland. Like, it's ridiculous. Right? <laughs> Apologies to anyone in Queensland watching. Um, it, it, that, that's, that's, that's the kind of idea. We know, we, if, you know if he's going to come from anywhere, he's going to come from Bethlehem. So if he's the Messiah, where is he from? Now, if you were Jesus, what would you say? You might say, look, John didn't tell you about it like earlier in the gospel, but um, actually I was from Bethlehem, as it turns out. You know, there were angels and there were shepherds and there were wise men and stars and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you remember that, you know that story? Um, you may have heard it. Uh, he could have said that, but he doesn't say that. It's interesting what Jesus says about himself uh, about, and where he's from. In verse 16, he says, My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. In other words, the words I'm saying to you have come from God himself. In fact, he sent me. He says the same thing down uh, in verse 29. Um, You don't know God, in verse 28, but I know him. Because I am from him and he sent me. And in verse uh, 33, verse 33 says the same thing. I'm going back to the Father who sent me. In other words, Jesus doesn't say, in answer to the question, are you from Galilee? He doesn't say, no, no, I'm from Bethlehem. He says, no, no, I'm from God. Bethlehem's like, that's small bickies compared to the fact of where he's really from. He's really from God. 
You see, there are some people, I think, who, like, who think Jesus is one of those people, he's just like all the other religious leaders. You know, there's so many religions in our world, and Jesus just happens to be one of them. And he's like, well, you can just pat him on the head and say, there, there, Jesus, what a lovely man. And, you know, we'll, we respect you as a religious leader like we might respect the Dalai Lama or we might respect Muhammad or we might respect, and we respect Jesus just like one of the others. But Jesus won't allow us to do that. He's not just a nice man. He's not just a good religious leader. He has come from God. When Jesus speaks, God speaks. That's what he's saying. That's why in verse, um, verse 30, when he's, he's just said, I've come from God, that's why they try to seize him. They try to arrest him. They try to kill him. Because he says, how dare you? How dare you say that you're from God? It's like standing up the front and saying you're the greatest person who's ever lived. That's essentially what Jesus is doing. That's why they want to get rid of him. That's why the, the religious leaders want to bump him off. And so at this point... You may be thinking, Steve, this is really not very helpful. Because Barbara said at the beginning, there's all sorts of different ideas about Jesus. Some people like him, some people don't. And it's like it's always been that way. People have always been confused about Jesus. Some like him, some don't. Some think he's the prophet. Some people is the Messiah. Some believe he's just a very naughty boy. So you may be kind of going, Steve, look, I just don't, you haven't helped me to become more certain about who Jesus is. What are we supposed to do? And that's, in essence, what this series is about. You may remember why John wrote this book. Can anybody remember? We've talked about it pretty much every week uh, as we've been in church. Can anybody remember why is it that John wrote this gospel? That's right. John says, I've written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20, verse 31. Um, that's why John wrote this. In fact, that's why all four Gospels, all four stories of Jesus' life are written. So that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. When Jesus makes outrageous claims, we can dismiss him out of hand or we can try and work out if he's, tr if he's right. Because if he's, if he's wrong, then we should just dismiss him and we should sleep in on Sunday mornings, right? But if he's right, then we need to listen. If God turned up here... To, to speak to us, my guess is you, you'd listen. And so as Jesus is saying, well, I've come from God. In fact, I am God. We need to listen. So how do we know? How, how do we decide what Jesus, whether Jesus really is this person? Well, there are three things in here that kind of slip through to the keeper. As I, I don't know if they did as for you as they were being read. And one of them is just be from just before it. There are three pieces of evidence that the people of Jesus' time saw and looked at, and it helped to convince them or otherwise. Okay? And I want to say to you that when it comes to Jesus, the best thing you can do is ask questions about him. Is ask questions about whether you believe these things or whether these things are true. And so these three pieces of evidence, I want to encourage you to ask these questions and say, well, do I believe these things? And the first one is there in verse 12. Among the crowds, there was a widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. They looked at Jesus' life and they saw someone who did good. He spent time with, he was like the opposite of John West, right? He spent time with the people that everyone else rejected. He spent time with the outcast. He actually uh, spent time with Samaritans, with prostitutes, with lepers, with tax collectors, with used car sal or used chariot salesmen. Uh, he spent time with the people everyone else wanted to, to uh, turn their back on. Uh, he cared for the poor. He cared for the hungry and the weak and the sick, the ones that everyone else thought were insignificant, the children, the women. Jesus loved them all. That's the kind of man he was. So they saw his lifestyle. But then... Um, they, that was not the only thing they noticed. In verse 15, it says, The Jews were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having studied? They listened to what he had said. The, the, uh, the soldiers who actually sent to arrest Jesus at the festival, they, they got there and they, they couldn't. They just couldn't bring themselves to do it. They went back and in verse 46, they say to the people who had sent them, the Pharisees, No one ever spoke the way this man does. So the second piece of evidence they saw was his teaching. The third thing they noticed was in verse 31. When the Christ comes, they asked, 
Will he do more miraculous signs than this man? They looked in this gospel, we've already seen Jesus turning water to wine, healing people from a distance. We've seen him um, feeding 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. We've seen him walking on the water. We're going to see more. We're going to see more healings. We're going to see Jesus even raise the dead. In fact, we're going to see the greatest miracle of all, Jesus himself coming back to life. Jesus did incredible things. As I said, this series and this gospel, in fact, all four of the gospels, are written so that we might believe. And so if you've got questions about who Jesus is, that's great. I'll encourage you to, f- to pursue those questions. But perhaps the way to do that is to look at the evidence. Rather than just listening to the social commentators or the comedians or whatever it is who want to dismiss Jesus out of hand, look at the evidence there is about him. Look at the Because we all had the same choice that they had as Jesus appeared. Not, all of us will, not everyone that sees Jesus will follow him. Some will reject him. But in the end, each one of us must decide what we think. And I want to encourage you to ask those questions, those three questions that the the people back then asked about Jesus. What kind of person was he? What was his lifestyle like? As you read the stories of Jesus, is he the kind of person that you, you can admire? Is he the kind of person that you would follow? Does he care for people? Does he have a heart of compassion for people? Is he the kind of person who is worth following? Or does he come across as a bit two-faced? What kind of person is he? Could he be trusted to care for you? So look at his lifestyle. Look at the kind of person he is. Secondly, listen to his teaching. Um, People have all sorts of um, ideas about what Jesus might have said, but what does he actually say? Does his teaching make sense? Uh, Is it the ramblings of a madman who's a bit like me at the beginning with delusions of grandeur? He's trying to pump himself up. Is he trying to butter up the crowd so that they'll all follow him and do what he says? Is he using those kind of um, manipulative techniques to kind of make, to change people's thinking so that they, they all kind of come like zombies following him? Is that the way Jesus teaches? Or is he like a con artist? that you can tell he's really trying to rip people off. That the things he says are just um, trying to manipulate people so that they'll look after him and that they'll give him all the good things. That he'll end up with, you know, 50,000 Rolls Royces and all the rest of it. Um, Is that the kind of, are they the kind of words that Jesus speaks? Thirdly, ask the question about the things he does, his miracles. I think a lot of people look at the miracles of Jesus and they go, look, I've never seen a miracle and so therefore they don't happen. Walking on water, how ridiculous. How could you believe that someone walked on water? That just just doesn't happen. Um, But that's, of course, precisely why they're called miracles. (laughs) Um, Because you don't see them happen. Um, And I want you to consider, if if God is real, and if God did come and live amongst us, what would you expect God to be able to do? What kind of things might God do? Does that fit with the kind of things that Jesus did? I think when you look openly and honestly, when you openly and honestly ask the questions of Jesus, I think the answers will come back, yes, yes, yes. Is he a good man? Yes, he is. Is his teaching true? Yes. Does it speak to my heart? Yes, it does. Do his miracles fit with someone who really has come from God? Yes, they do. I believe that when you do that, you'll see that Jesus really is someone who can fulfil that promise. Because it is important that we, what we decide here because remember what Jesus is offering. He's not just offering you know, a, a, you know, a set of steak knives. He's offering eternal life. And not just eternal in length, but eternal in quality. Total fulfilment and contentment and joy and peace. All those things that what we yearn for in our lives. Jesus says, I can give you those things. I can fulfil you. And I will fulfill you forever. I will come to live in you. And it will be like a a well of water welling up inside you. They're pretty high stakes, I reckon. If Jesus can do what he says he can, then that's incredible. And so I want to encourage everyone here this morning, and everyone who's watching online, to investigate Jesus. Don't stop asking questions about him. But when you ask the question... Look for the answer. Try and find the answer. And the best place to go, I think, is is where the evidence is written. 
down in these Gospels. How about I pray that God would help each one of us to come to a true understanding of who Jesus is. Let me pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as we look back at these crowds um, and, and see the kind of um, the difference of opinion that people have, it reminds us so much of our world. And it could remind us of ourselves because sometimes we think Jesus is great and sometimes we're not so sure. Lord, I pray that you would help us in that, those times when we don't feel sure, in our confusion, in our doubts even. Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep on questioning Jesus. Keep, help us to keep looking at who he is, the kind of person he is. Help us to keep listening to the things he says, the promises he makes. Help us to keep looking at what he does. And Father, as we do that, help us to see the real Jesus. Help us to see that he really has come from you and so can give us life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Uh, before I pray, I just wanted to mention two things. Um, when you come in the foyer, there's always these booklets, and they're for praying. Barbara, I'm doing it. Um, BCA, and that'll actually change this week because new ones are coming out. Um, prayers about Simon and Jess Cowell in Italy, and more about CMS. Uh, Anglicare, the whole year diary, and Anglican Aid. So I encourage you to pick those up, or if you're not actually into paper, you can use the Prayer Mate app, and you can read it on your phone. So that was um, just letting you know that, and that would be really great. And also, secondly, I wanted to share what happened to me last Sunday. Some of you may remember that I was actually leading the service. And at the end of the service, um, a man, a visitor here, came down and said to me, are you Jenny Stubbs? And I said, yes. And he says, I've been praying for you for over 10 years. I didn't know this man. I've been praying for you with BCA and Dusty Boots uh, when you worked in the Northwest Diocese. And it's so great to meet you. And we've continued to pray for you, my wife and me, that you would not be lonely when Rob died. Hmm. And I could assure them, and she came down, and I assured them that I'm not lonely because we're a great family, great friends, um, beautiful church and a beautiful community. And um, we don't always get that privilege to tell people that their prayer has been answered. And for me, just blown away that people you don't even know for you are that dedicated to praying for you. So never underestimate the power of prayer. Okay, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the triune God, creator of heaven and earth, and your ownership of all things. We recognise that you have given custodianship of these lands upon which we meet to the First Nations people of this area. In your sovereignty, you have allowed other people groups to migrate to these shores, and we acknowledge the cultures of our First Nations people and are thankful for the community that we share. So we pray, uh, pay our respects to the elders, uh, both past and present, and those who are rising up to become leaders. And we lift up to you, the leaders of the world, our country and our local community, that they will have wisdom to lead for the good of all people and the respect for the lands, your creation. And we lift up to you, our ministry team, Stephen Lorna and John and Fiona and Michelle Young, and those involved in children's and youth activities and the SRE in the schools, and other outreach activities. Giving thanks for our Tuesday calf group, Sip and Stitch, and the Explorers group outing last Thursday. May you encourage them and enable them to show your love. And as we enter the season of Lent, we thank you that in the gospel you offer forgiveness of sins and acceptable righteousness of Christ so that we might be saved. We pray that we will be able to see your kindness and mercy in this offer and receive it by faith. May we never be ashamed of this gospel, no matter how difficult the ridicule or the pain or how attractive other enticements may be. And as Paul states in Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. And we do thank you, Lord, that we can call on you to help so many people who are in need. And we pray for Turkey and Syria suffering the devastating earthquakes for New Zealand hit by the earthquake after suffering the devastating cyclone. We pray for healing and good medical care for those who have been injured, for those who have lost homes and possessions, meet their daily needs for food and clean water and shelter, and provide for them to rebuild their homes and their livelihoods. We pray for comfort to those who mourn and help them to know your loving presence as their Heavenly Father. And for our family and our friends who are unwell or are troubled at this time, please be with them and reveal your mercies to them. And we're reminded in Psalm 127.1 that unless the Lord builds the house, the labourers labour in vain. And we give you thanks for those who do spread the gospel, for Simon and Jess Cowell and Lydia and Emma and Timothy and Sophia in Italy. We particularly pray for wisdom for pastoring their church GBU and the Together Coordinator and Fogia, and for energy and perseverance amidst the challenges of long term ministry in Italy. For James and Brittany Damon and their induction last week in Cobar, enable them to settle in quickly 
and make strong connections to the people they meet. We pray for our parish. We pray for our AGM today, for wisdom, for understanding, for patience, as we seek as a Christian community to spread the gospel in the best way possible in our beautiful community of Gerringong, Jeroa and beyond. And we give you thanks for those who have had leadership and supporting roles in the last 12 months. Today we pray for people to come forward and support those seeking leadership in so many roles of ministry here. Lord Jesus, may you continue to build your house to be strong and effective and a true light in our community. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And join with me with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jenny, um, for that reminder about praying for our missionaries and for the, mission, for the gospel going out locally, nationally and internationally. And even though for many of us uh, we're not caught, necessarily called to go out onto that mission field outside of Jeringong, in fact, uh, we have a strategic role to play in praying for our missionaries and giving and supporting them. And Jenny mentioned the Damons, and they came and visited us a couple of years ago. And I realize there are a few people here who haven't been here for so long, so uh, we've been linked with James and Brittany for a few years now, and they work for the Bush Church Age Society, taking the gospel to remote parts of this state. Um, they had two years in Narrow Mind. Um, James is an evangelist. Then they were attached to the church in Mudgee, and lastly, as Jenny said, they've gone to Cobar. And because James is now ordained, he's the minister at Cobar. Now, interestingly enough, in January, a lady came to our church here. She came twice. And she was from Cobar having holidays here. And she belonged to that church. And she said to us that they have not had a full-time minister in Cobar for 20 to 0 years. So they are absolutely delighted that James and Brittany are coming, and they're just so thankful that the Lord has answered their prayers and that they're now settling in, and their commissioning service, as Jenny said, was last week, and now they're starting their ministry. So please pray for them at this strategic point in their ministry and keep praying for them and doing our part in the gospel going out in that area of Koba. Thank you. Um, can I just say a huge thank you? I want to say thank you to Barbara and also the people on the mission committee for helping to keep us in touch with all the different mission organisations. It's great what you're doing. Thank you. Um, just two things to bring to your attention. One is a reminder that next Saturday um, is the first Saturday in March, which means? Prayer meeting. That's right, it's our prayer meeting. So um, our parish prayer meeting from 8 till 9, um, an opportunity to pray, to pray for mission, but also to pray for our world and to pray for our church. Uh, so please come and join us for that. So I'll be here in the hall from 8 till 9 on Saturday. Uh, and the other thing is to remind people about our um, AGM, which you all, I know you're all aware that is on. But that, that will be starting, we'll try and get a bit of a turnaround, try and start by quarter to 12. So please have some morning tea. Um, to our visitors, I want to say thank you for coming. It's lovely to have you here. I probably won't get a chance to say hello to you afterwards because I'll be running around getting things ready for the meeting. But um, I know everybody else will welcome you, so it's great to have you here. Let's have some morning tea together. Um, it looks like a beautiful day, so we might actually go outside. Perhaps, take, perhaps we could take the morning tea outside um, and we can, uh, so the kids will be out there and we'll be out there with them. So let's do that together. Um, but yeah, come back in here. Uh, as you come back in, there will be on the, uh, a table at the back with a, a sign-in sheet and so if you've been part of our church for three months or more then you're very welcome to um to vote and be part of that meeting um you're welcome to come to the meeting anyway if you're just a visitor it's fine um but uh if you need to sign the declaration and show that you've been there i think you write your name and then you sign next to it okay so that will be there so this is going to be our last song what an appropriate one to finish with christ our hope in life and death please stand <laughs>
What a wonderfully victorious song to finish off with today. But if you still have questions about is Jesus the Christ, well, follow the guidance from Steve and follow that up. And as you can see, if you would like to pray with somebody after the service, Kim and Greg are available if you want to come to the front. Or if you'd like to go somewhere a little bit more quiet, uh, you could go to the church and, and, uh, and pray over there. Now, I'd just like to finish with these verses. I've been reading Ephesians in my quiet time this week, and I'd just love to finish with these amazing verses. A prayer. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be fulfilled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that it is at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please grab morning tea.